As we enter the Christmas season, churches all across America and the world will be taking the next five Sundays to focus on aspects of uh, Christ's birth. Today is the advent or the coming, the interruption of hope. Then we have peace, joy, and love. And then the theme of New Year's Eve, of Christmas Eve, is light, when God sent light into the world. And when we look at each of these aspects of the birth of Jesus Christ, we can see how the world pushes against them. We can see how the world is a place, for example, where there is no peace, where there is no love, and certainly no hope. And if we look at how the world was back in the time of Jesus Christ, we will see that God brought the world to a place of hopelessness. God, if you read through the Bible, loves contrasts. He loves to show that this is how the world does things, but this is how he is going to do things. The contrast of good versus evil, the contrast of hope versus hopelessness. And when we speak of hope, hope in the biblical sense means a favorable or positive view of the future. Uh, there is a comic strip with Snoopy that says, yesterday I, used to, I was a dog, today I'm a dog, tomorrow I will probably still be a dog. Sigh. There's so little hope for advancement. And that is how some people will live their lives, as they will look at what they have today and say, this is not going to change. And in doing this, they will begin to lose hope. They will have no positive view of the future, whether that future be tomorrow, or whether that future be next year, or the end of their life. And so we can look at how God shaped the first century to create a, almost a sense of worldwide hopelessness so that when the hope of Jesus Christ showed up, it is such a vast difference that people could easily recognize it. There's nothing in what God does or what Jesus Christ did at his birth that could be considered subtle, that could be considered nuanced, that we might miss it. It was all spectacular, it was all flamboyant and fabulous. So if we remember back to the first century or the intertestamental period in your Bible, you have two testaments. The Old Testament is from Genesis to Malachi, and when Malachi ends, the Jewish people, many tens of thousands, have returned from captivity to Jerusalem. They have rebuilt a smaller version of the temple. They have rebuilt the wall and they are trying to get back to the business of following God and being God's chosen people. And then the Old Testament just ends. The Persian Empire is in control of the world. It is a world empire. We do not have world empires today. Uh, we are, have big countries and small countries and big tribes and small tribes. But back then, the king of Persia was considered the king of all people on the earth. And as we enter the intertestamental period, Alexander the Great was being born and he was coming to, into his own. And he raised an army of Spartans and using the might of the Greek army and the Greek navy, beat back the Persians, and the Greeks became the world power, and it changed hands. And one thing that Alexander the Great did when he went from country to country is he didn't wipe them out. If you look back at, at ancient armies like the Assyrians, the Assyrians would come in, and if they came to California, for example, they would kill all the adults, just kill them, because they're useless. They would take all of the uh, boys and put them in military training and train them up to be part of the Assyrian army. And they would take all the young girls and they would marry them off. 
and there would be no sign of our culture left. There would be no sign of our language because there would be no sign of our people. The Greek people said that's not productive because if you kill everybody, who's going to work for you? And so he went, and everywhere he went, he taught everybody the Greek language and the Greek culture. It's called Hellenizing. He turned the whole world Greek, Alexander the Great did, so that by the time of his death, there was a government set up in Greece that was very similar to ours. Our government in America is based on the idea of representative governments. They had senators in Greece that would collectively make the decisions for how things would be in the world and manage all trade. And trade was now possible because you could take a ship with goods to any country in the world and they would all speak Greek. They would all have uh, Greek ideas of how trade was done. They would all been Hellenized by Alexander the Great and that was a very unifying factor of the world. And then the Romans came into power in the intertestamental period and they beat back the Greek Spartans and they set up uh, their world government and they also followed the Greek idea of senators. There were representatives of every country and every people in the world in Italy. And their idea was not so much to care what language people spoke, but to make sure they all use the same currency because Rome wanted to tax everybody to death. It was a very expensive lifestyle that the, the Roman machine of conquest had. And so they constantly needed money. And so they built roads everywhere to move their armies and they taxed everybody. And when Jesus Christ is born, you are in the middle of the Roman rule. And if you read through the Gospels, several times in the Gospels, there comes up the question of tax. And do we pay tax? And is paying tax within God's will? And those kinds of questions. Because the only relationship that the Jewish people had with the Roman government in Europe was taxes. Now in 49 B.C., uh, Rome changed from a, from a senatorial representative type government to a dictatorship, to an emperorship, and that was when Julius Caesar marched his army across the Rubicon, and you've heard the phrase, crossing the Rubicon, that is an irreversible act that he did, and that's what the idiom has been come to mean, an irreversible act. And he took his army into the Senate in Italy and he basically conquered them and said, I am now going to be a one-man government and you guys can either be yes men, you can either follow me and do what I say, or I will kill you. And he was a very uh, brutal and ruthless emperor. And emperors followed him usually by killing the previous emperor. And we know that Julius Caesar was actually uh, killed by the senators because they didn't agree with his politics. But then another emperor rose, and you have Caesar, which is, means emperor. Augustus is in charge when Jesus is born. And if you read the story uh, in the book of Luke about how it is, it is set up, Mary and Joseph were betrothed. It was probably an arranged marriage. They were engaged from the time they were probably eight or nine years old. They were, they were destined to be together by the two families. They were poor families, so it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a marriage for money, but it was a marriage for strength of family, families that have similar beliefs, that have similar ideals in the Jewish culture. Uh, they would be put together and therefore increase their, their pull on the community, if you will. And so there, the whole thing with the Holy Spirit happens, and Mary is impregnated, and Mary gets a visit by an angel, and Joseph gets a visit by an angel, and 
Zechariah in the temple gets a visit by the angel, and God is sending these angels to let people know the game plan of what God is going to do, that there's no, no guesswork as to what's going to happen, that the, the rules of engagement of God being born as a baby is given out through angels, which are God's messengers. And once this is set up, then you have Mary and Joseph just waiting out, as it were, for the birth of Jesus. And then one day, probably Saturday in the synagogue, a Roman soldier bursts in and announces that there's going to be a worldwide tax, that Caesar Augustus doesn't have enough money. He now wants to count everybody, and once you're counted, he's going to tax you. And it isn't like today when you get a tax bill and you write a check and you mail it in. You actually had to go to the town of your ancestors because that's where your family records were held. And from there, your lineage could be traced. It could be determined how much you would pay. And then you would be taxed and you would feed, as it were, the armies of the Roman Empire. And at that moment, if you can imagine, it would be like somebody knocking on your door, a a U.S. Marshal, saying that because the government wants to register you, you now have to go back to the place where your ancestors first came into America, whatever town that would be, and you have 30 days to do it, to pack up everything and to move, and you don't know how long you're going to be there because we don't know how long this tax is going to be, your life would be ruined. It would definitely be upsetting, but you would, in fact, businesses would shut down. You would not only lose your job, there would probably be no company when you came back. The movement of goods, of where the of where the grocery stores are and where the various services and gas stations are as all those people have to leave to go to Minnesota or Massachusetts or New York or Florida or wherever the boat landed so many years ago and stay there until the government counted you and then you would be taxed and you had to figure out how to raise that money. That is what Mary and Joseph And the whole Roman Empire was involved in their lives because one man said, I want more money. The lives of everybody in Israel and the whole world were disrupted and disrupted to the fact that many people, many towns, many organizations did not recover And if you consider for a moment that God is creating a world in which there is no hope, in which parents would get up in the morning and look at their kids and they would not know whether their children would live to be 10 years old because of the diseases that were occurring in the Roman Empire. They would not know if after their child made it to 15 or so, if a soldier would just grab him off the street and make him a soldier and put him in some foreign land in the Roman army because one way that they beefed up the Roman army was they would basically kidnap people that were being occupied, put them in the army, and then send them off to foreign lands. And parents would never know. There would be no way to communicate. Most people in Israel were subsistence farmers, which means they maybe could eke out enough to get one meal today. And most of the people in Jesus' time and Jesus himself usually ate one meal a day in the evening that everybody would go into the fields, would go into the service places and work 10, 12 hours and then get a denarius, which is a day's wage. And then everybody in the evening as the sun was setting would make their way to the market, buy some kind of food, and then go home and cook it for their family. And so the idea that there was something that an average citizen could do to push back against the government at that time 
was unknown, that if you were to ask any man on the street in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus' birth, do you have any hope? They would say, I don't even know how to spell it anymore. There is no hope. They are hopeless. Hopeless, a negative view of the future. If hope is a positive view of the future, then if you are hopeless, if you have no hope, then you are pessimistic, you have a negative view of the future, you feel that there's no way it can get better, there's no way that this can be fixed, all you got to do is survive until your kids are grown, and then you can die in peace, was basically the view of most people under the Roman Empire. Life in that time was capricious, it was arbitrary, it was unpredictable, and there was no evidence that anything was going to change because every time an up-and-coming Caesar would kill the last one, then that one was more vicious or more mentally ill until you get to ones like Nero, who burned the city just to blame it on the Christians, to turn political power and political opinion back to him. The idea that you would sacrifice your entire country just for political power is what people saw in the Caesars, is what people saw in the emperors. And so in a time of great hopelessness, in a time of, I have no idea what tomorrow's going to hold, tomorrow's going to be worse than today, was the thought. These angels start showing up, talking to the main characters in the story, and God's number one message is that he's back. And he's back with force, and he's back with his son. And the banner that his son will carry his whole life is one of hope. Because for the first time in the history of the world, I can look to the future and I can be positive about it. I can look to the future and have a favorable view of it because God is now working in the world. And so today, is the message of hope still a valid message today? Today in America, it seems that everything is political. You have to pick a side, and if you pick the wrong side, well, all hope is gone. And people may get up there and say that they will bring hope. They, the politicians can promise all sorts of hope. And what they're saying is that if you vote for them or support their programs then you will have a favorable future that, that things will work out for you and your tribe and your group and your side is what is being said. But when you have everything is political, things can change in a moment and some strange accusation or Facebook post can turn things around almost instantly with your champion in Washington and that hope disappears when they disappear because if they're being accused of things then there's a good chance that if you still vocally support them you will be accused of things and it is difficult for people today and I read stories of parents who say they don't know how to raise their kids in a political view and these are people clearly without God, because if you're trying to raise a son or a daughter to pick the right side or to publicly make this point or that point and you guess wrong, then, then all hope is lost for your child to have a place. But if we take Jesus Christ and the message of Jesus Christ is hope today, because when we preach Christ, when we lift up Jesus Christ, when we witness and give the gospel, it is a gospel of hope. Because I can now take all this politics and I can take all these accusations and all the hate that's on the web and I can just put it over here. 
because it no longer matters. I'm over here with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ rises above these things. Jesus Christ gives a, a place to raise your children. Jesus Christ gives you a place to live where you can wake up in the morning and have hope because you are not on a political team. You are on God's team. And Jesus Christ transcended the Persians. He transcended the Greeks. He transcended the Romans and every single power and government that has come since then. Jesus Christ has been above it and he has been giving hope to people in the most hopeless places. We have, as Americans, about 10 million missionaries uh, that we either sponsor or that actually have left America. We're found it, finding that it is more profitable to get people uh, from Syria, for example, bring them here, train them, and then send them back because they have the knowledge of the culture and the idioms and, and what's going on. Syria being an example of a hopeless place, of a place that has been in civil war for a very long time. You don't know when you go to bed whether your building will be bombed by a rocket during the middle of the night and you won't wake up. There is no hope. But when the civil war was at its height, a plane of 400 American-trained Syrian missionaries landed in Syria. And that was the last anybody heard of them. Because you cannot be a Christian in Syria, they just went everywhere. And our belief and our prayer has been that thousands were saved, that as this attack or that attack and this side and that side were fighting, that people were boldly going out and proclaiming the love of Jesus Christ, the hope of Jesus Christ, that even in a place like Syria, like North Korea, like China, like Iran, where they will kill you for being a Christian, there are people in those countries, there are missionaries in every language group, in every tribe, in every nation on this earth, Nobody is being forgotten. Everybody is being reached for Christ. And the more oppressive the government, the more difficult it is to be a Christian, the stronger the message of hope. Because what they bring is that the Iranian government has no hold over you. That yes, they can put you in prison, but your future is massively positive because Jesus Christ has your back, is on your team. And so that first Christmas seemed, I'm sure, chaotic and scary and arbitrary and why me and these kinds of things were being said. But Mary and Joseph traveled slowly by donkey. I don't know if you've ever tried to move a pregnant woman by donkey. It doesn't go very fast a very slow trek all the way to Bethlehem. And when we look at the prophecies, the Old Testament clearly predicted that Bethlehem would be the birthplace of Jesus Christ. And so we can think, well, maybe God put it in Caesar's mind to have this worldwide tax to move them from here to there. The Old Testament is also clear that Jesus was born in a stable and so God probably moved lots of people into all the dwelling places in Bethlehem so that when they showed up, there was no room at the inn. To move them into the stable, would Mary and Joseph have wanted a nice, warm, enclosed place to have the baby? I'm sure they did. But God wanted them in the stable because God creates contrast, not the way the world does it, but the way he does it. And at this Christmas, our opportunity is, is simply this, to look to God, to have a massively positive view of the future, because we are God's and he is ours. 
And on this Christmas, we can study and learn and pray that God will give us hope that whatever your financial situation, whatever your health situation, whatever your age situation, you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that tomorrow is going to be fantastic because Jesus is yours and you are his and you have that one thing the world can never give and that is hope. Hope, unbelievable, perfect hope. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, you started this process back at the foundation of the world. It came to a head 2,000 years ago with the birth of Jesus Christ. And your hope continues on today. We know that you are in the business of hope. And as such, we are also in the business of hope. Hope is our business. We are purveyors of hope because the world can offer hope, but it will only last a few hours or a few days at most. When you offer hope, it is eternal. When we believe in Jesus Christ, above all, above all everything, our future is greatly positive and favored. Lord, we thank you for that, and we ask your blessing on this Christmas season. I thank you for all that you have done for us during the year, and as the year comes to an end, teach us to praise you and to give you all the glory. We ask all this through the blood of Christ. Amen.